How's it going? Uh, I'm Cozy, this is Dave. We are both second years here. For everyone who's new here, welcome, and thanks for coming tonight. Um, so this is part of our monthly guest lecture series, uh, which is really meant to supplement, like, uh, first and foremost, meant to supplement like, our uh, courses here, uh, but also to like, kind of explore the different ways that like, interaction design can uh, play a part in and push the definition of interaction design. Uh, so past speakers have come from you know, like data visualization, like Nick Felton, or uh, from like VR, uh, with, uh, we had Milita and Winslow in, um, in the first semester in September. Um, and for everyone who wants to know a little bit more about our program, we are going to have the open house on Friday, so please come. Um, but I'll let Dave introduce our speakers for tonight. Cool, thanks. Do I need that or? No. Okay. Yeah, so um, we have two amazing speakers tonight. Really excited to introduce them. Uh, first, we have Rob G. Rob <laughs> GM Pietro. Uh, <laughs> and he is the creative lead at Google Design, based in New York City here. He's currently leading the design efforts there and the SPAN conferences, if you're familiar with those. Um, previously, principal at Project Projects, also in New York. And he's been involved in the MFA graphic design program at RISD. Um, I think our program here at SVA, uh, Parsons, and he was previously the VP of AIGA in New York City, and uh, has also worked with Pentagram and the New York Times. And uh, Bethany Fong is uh, coming to visit all the way from California. Uh, she is at the Mountain View headquarters in Google, and she is a senior interaction designer there, uh, currently on the mater material design team. Her background is in engineering at Stanford, but her focus was on product design. Um, responsible for much of the spec, so if you've seen material.google.com, you're familiar with the, the design guidelines uh, for material design. But she's also responsible for many of the core design concepts of the system. Uh, if you are familiar with the floating action button or fab, um, she's also the accessibility lead on Google material design and Android as well, I believe, and the author of the accessibility section within the material design spec. Uh, she was also my manager and mentor this past summer at Google, and I just learned so much from her. So I'm really honored to welcome both of them here. So give them a warm welcome. Um, so thanks for having us. Um, I'm, we're so pleased to be at SVA. Uh, and I'm also really pleased to be in the same room as Bethany, since we're usually on separate coasts. Yes. Um, and also, obviously, it's, like, it's an odd night. So <laughs> we appreciate you coming out uh, and you know, thinking about design tonight. I think one of the things that we're lucky to be able to do at Google is work at great scale. Um, and obviously, you know, a lot of people can make a difference. So. In that spirit, we soldier on tonight. Um, and I'll maybe let Bethany kick it off. Sure. So hello. Um, I'm Bethany. This is Rob. And uh, we're here on behalf of Google Design. So what is Google Design? What is material design? Um, so Google Design. Uh, at Google Design, we demonstrate and communicate Google's design leadership through articles, events, education, and community building efforts. And this is actually what Rob heads up. Um, and material design is kind of within that effort, um, and we consider it to be a unified design system that combines theory, resources, and tools so that you can craft really great digital, ex digital experiences. And a little bit about us. Um, I'm from California. I'm from uh, really close to Yosemite National Park. Uh, went to Stanford for their mechanical engineering and product design program and spent a lot of time in their product realization lab actually making physical products, uh, but kind of teaching myself software on the side. Um, after I graduated, I spent some time working with kids with disabilities at Abilities United in Palo Alto. Um, and at that time, I got a really good sense of what the spectrum of needs are for the users of technology. Um, and so I really value my time at Abilities United. Um, and I'm currently at Google, so I've been here for a little over five years. It is currently at the end of my rainbow. You can see that. I took that photo out of my office window. Um, had the chance to mentor Dave this last summer. Um, yeah, and I'm in Mountain View. Cool, yeah, and um, I, uh, I have been based in New York for about 15 years. Um, I've had 
I uh, had my own studio for several years. Uh, then I was very fortunate to join Project Projects as a principal. I uh, worked there for five years. Uh, worked on projects like um, the, the SALT Museum in Istanbul, uh, the identity and website for that new museum, uh, the RISD Museum uh, identity and website, um, and also great projects that involve the history of design. So things like uh, the Cooper Hewitt Museum's graphic design now in production show, which was sort of a survey show of the last uh, decade of design history. Uh, which, which was an exhibition uh, on Governor's Island in New York. Um, so um, Project Projects is still active, a wonderful studio. Um, uh, and I've also, alongside all of those things, uh, been writing and thinking about design. Um, so uh, doing that for about 15 years, um, and uh, all of my writing and things are collected on the website Lined and Unlined, so I try to give them away so that you can access them and use them for what you'd like to do. A lot of my um, course syllabi are also uh, online and online, and um, you know, to that end, as Dave, as Dave said, uh, I've been a teacher for all of the time that I've been practicing. So I uh, got my start at Parsons, have been very lucky to be here at SVA on various occasions, um, was a founding faculty member of the branding program here uh, with Debbie Millman, and, uh, and also for the last 10 years have taught in the MFA graphic design department at RISD. Um, so yeah, so as Bethany, Bethany showed Mountain View, this is th not quite a rainbow in front of the New York office. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, but when I got to Google, it looked like that. Now it looks like this. Um, we still recognize it. Uh, I feel like on my first day of work, they were like, we're changing the logo. And I was like, what? Like, <laughs> so crazy. Uh, we're across the street from Chelsea Market where we sneak off to get tacos sometimes. Um, and I, I basically, you know, helped to sort of um, manage the designers in the office who are often working on the material design system. Um, I also head up uh, uh, Google Design, which is our outreach efforts, um, as Dave noted. And then often uh, in New York, some sort of special projects fall onto our desk. Uh, and so about two weeks after starting at Google, um, the Google fonts arrived. <laughs> um, and it arrived by the way of Omer Ziv uh, and Dave Crosland, who were two people working on Google fonts at the time, um, kind of excited uh, to, to see a friendly typography driven face around the office um, and sort of wanted to share some ideas with me about how we could make Google Fonts um, better. Um, and I, I guess I maybe we thought we'd start here as kind of just a way to think more deeply about some of the things we do at Google, and then I'll talk a little bit more about Google Design itself. But, um, but you know, Google Fonts was started before my time at Google in 2010, and if you kind of like wind your time machine back to that time, um, you know, the, the web was not super uh, accepting of lots of different fonts. Um, you kind of would use JavaScript or flash hacks or images, things that were not very you know, machine readable and would often slow down the web. And so for users on slow connections and things like that, that really had a meaningful impact in terms of their experience. Um, so after the product was launched, um, very, very quickly within a year, um, they were already serving a billion font views a day. And you know, that sounds like a big number, but it's even kind of more amazing when you think about the fact that when you download a Google font, um, in, it caches in your browser for a year. So that means that like, you know, it's not like you're downloading that font every day and it's creating a billion views. It's actually once a year that people are getting that. Um, you know, quickly kind of up and to the right to the point where now we're serving about 15 billion uh, font views a day, which is really a staggering number. Uh, in aggregate, that means there's well over 10 trillion uh, font views. Um, it was very exciting to see us go from 9 trillion to 10 trillion uh, very quickly right after the relaunch, so design matters. Um, the other way that we matter, and maybe in a more meaningful way, is that we broaden access to great typography to the rest of the world. So um, when we relaunched the product, there were, there were fonts available in 135 new languages across 13 different scripts. Um, and for a lot of people, that means you know, being able to not just uh, make things look more beautiful, but be able to find them in their native language. Um, and so you know, things like Devon De Devonagari or Greek or different things like this. This is what it used to look like. Uh, powerful tool, not the most beautiful design. Um, the, there wasn't really a designer on the team. It was a, um, primarily a back-end engineering team, as still is. Uh, that's how they're able to serve all of those font views in such a stable and reliable way. Um, but uh, you know, because Google is making this push into design and into being more conscious about design um, and in, in really trying to lead in a lot of different ways, um, you know, we, we wanted to make sure that great typography was part of that message. Um, and so we thought, well, what it, wouldn't it be interesting if we could take um, this interface and actually materialize it and in the process of doing that, you know, bring material design to it, and in the process really start thinking about um, what tools look like in material design, what tools for designers look like in material design, because that was also something that we were thinking a lot about. So this is sort of what we did. 
Um, and I think if you can, you know, I think if you can look at this, it's sort of, um, it's, it's much more simplified. The type is really more the star. Um, you can now click and interact with the type, so you can actually, you know, format the type and apply that format to lots of other types. Um, there's better filtering and browsing. Uh, there's some delight, like there's a really beautiful little color picker that I'll show a video of in a minute. Um, but I also think that one of the nice things is just to think about the difference between type that you read and type that you see. So, you know, um, so there's type that you see here, and then there's Roboto in the material design system, which is actually the type that you read. And you can kind of, um, you can kind of like understand how to parse the page, even though it's all made of type, in terms of the functions of these different things. Um, so when the catalog got started, it started with 14 fonts. Uh, by the time we launched, it had over 800 fonts in the catalog. That's a lot of fonts for people to have to navigate through and select. So we tried to do a lot of things to make selecting and browsing and grouping fonts easier. Some of that was on the user side to let them do that for themselves. But we also introduced a little bit of editorial and educational uh, elements to that. So teaching users how to think about typography. So we made some great collections like this. Um, and we rewrote all of the descriptions of all the typefaces and created specimen pages for those so that users could understand you know, what the attributes of this typeface were, what it was designed to do. And I think really significantly wrote d bios for all the designers of these typefaces so that you could get a sense of like who designed this thing. Um, because um, typographers are really amazing technicians in addition to being great designers. Um, and you know, in order to kind of really kind of put a cherry on top, we um, launched three new typefaces and added those to the collection with, with really celebrated type design studios. So one was Scope One for, with Dalton Mog, which was designed to be a beautiful titling serif for Google Slides. Uh, another one was Bungie, uh, which is kind of a more experimental typeface by David Jonathan Ross of, uh, of Font Bureau. Um, kind of harkening back to some Art Deco ideas, but also something that you can stack vertically or apply lots of inline styles to. Uh, and finally, Space Mono, which was designed by Colophon in the UK. There were also speakers at the SPAN conference, and in fact, this project began as a result of the SPAN conference. Um, but you know, they wanted to contribute sort of a really, a really fresh, young mono space that sort of gave, spoke a little bit to, to geek chic uh, alongside everything else. Um, you know, it's important to think about type not just as something that's on a screen, but of course something that originates a lot of times in print. So we made Google Fonts' first print specimen of Space Mono, and we also made um, a great poster of all of the different Google Fonts just to show that you could use them in lots of different ways um, and, and celebrate that. Um, and within a couple of days of releasing Space Mono, we were so excited to see this Kickstarter uh, about the amazing hero of ours, designer Dieter Rams. Um, using Space Mono in some of its swag and in some of its titling and stuff like that. Um, so I have a short little launch video that I'll show you about Google Fonts. Um, so I'll stop there. I could talk about Google Fonts for a long time, but, um, <laughs> but if you have more questions, I'm happy to take them in Q&A too. Um, so the, another aspect of what we do, and a really big aspect of what I do, is uh, Google Design, which is really our design outreach efforts, but also our work to kind of show design leadership uh, within the company and, and across lots of companies. Um, and uh, that, uh, some, one of the things we do that's really important is create conversations around design and technology to kind of bring in other viewpoints and, and, and learn from the industry um, and from designers writ large. And um, that process of creating those conversations started in San Francisco in 2014 um, with, this, with this inaugural conference, which was called Form. Um, and you know, there was a lot of great programming, uh, looking at different aspects of the industry, including a uh, design education panel with Michael Rock from 2x4, Enrique Allen from Designer Fund, and others. Um, 
And in uh, 2015, we sort of re-inaugurated the conference as SPAN, um, and we decided to have it not in one, but in two locations, that one sort of international and another domestic. Uh, so the, the domestic one was in New York, um, and it was not far from here on, in Highline Stages, and it looked like this. Um, and I just sort of brought little samples of the identity. The identity involved our, our material design icons, but in animating them and kind of bringing them to life in lots of different ways. And we always had them in sort of these little clusters so that we could get a sense of multiple ideas kind of coming into parallax together. Um, and we also sort of thought a little bit more about the programming and in really spotlighting some individual creative talents that were maybe not exactly what you'd think of at a, at a Google design conference, but maybe nonetheless had something to say about the design that we do. So one of those people is Nick Benson, who's a third generation MacArthur Genius Grant winning stone carver. Um, you know, someone who thinks a lot about material in his design process um, using one of the most ancient design processes for creating letter forms. And he just gave an incredible talk about his work and his process um, in, making, in making these incredible things. Um, from there, we went to London. Um, one of my highlights from London was Luna Maurer. And seeing Luna Maurer uh, of the Studio Moniker in Amsterdam uh, get a standing ovation from uh, a, a group of developers who sort of were completely like newly exposed to this work. Uh, it was just really exciting to kind of think about the personal aspects of code and programmatic thinking and the way that she humanizes those things in her practice. Um, about a month ago, a little bit more, uh, we were in Tokyo uh, for this year's sp uh, SPAN series. Um, and uh, this is what the identity looked like there. Uh, we kind of didn't want to uh, exactly repeat what we did before, but we wanted to kind of continue to permute and extend it. So again, you see this sort of aggregate of shapes, maybe this time more suggestive of things like engineering, uh, you know, flow charts, uh, electrical programming, and things like this. Um, you know, they, you know, as we worked with them, they began to animate and move in various ways, uh, kind of like serving as like standards for interaction design in a lot of different ways. Um, and then, you know, another really important aspect of the program this year was the bilingual aspect of it. So, you know, we were doing an entire conference in Japanese. That meant all of our content needed to be accessible in Japanese. Um, which is no small feat, let me tell you. Um, but I think one of the highlights in terms of the programming there was, uh, for me, was to see Naosha Inoue, who's a surrealist artist, painter, and background artist for Studio Ghibli in Tokyo, kind of a 85-year-old artist, um, paired with Mike Taika, who's the Google engineer that helped to originate Deep Dream, which is where you can kind of have a, take, a, take a beginning image and dream other images into it using machine learning. And to see how remarkably similar their processes are and how remarkably similar uh, the results are also um, was really extraordinary. And then from there, we went to LA, just got back two weeks ago. Um, it looked like this. We had the amazing Arcana Bookshop pop up um, in our space, in our marketplace space. And I think one of the real highlights there was this panel discussion around design fictions. So we had um, kind of uh, Rachel Bean from, from Google moderated it. Uh, Jeff McFetridge, who did the UI design for her, obviously a film that we think a lot about at Google. Um, Ash Thorpe, who did the, who did the uh, motion work for Prometheus. Um, Dave Addy, who runs a blog called um, Typeset in the Future, which is about sort of futuristic typography. And then to kind of give us a real future, um, Jesse Kawada from the Jet Propulsion Lab, which is, of course, a really important part of Los Angeles history. Um, so, you know, really great cross-section of people thinking about futures in lots of different ways. Um, and one of the things we do for the SPAN conference is, you know, you get lots of, you know, when you go to tech conferences, you get lots of devices, you get lots of swag. And we were thinking, like, well, what's some swag? We've got all these amazing people in the room for one day, and then it, and then it all gets taken apart, and they all go away. How can we kind of create something that lasts a little bit more uh, and really maybe contributes to design thinking overall? And so we started to make a book. It's, we call it the SPAN Reader. Uh, the first one from 2015 looked like this. Um, and it was tremendously exciting to us when the Walker Arts Center got in touch with us to learn more about why we put this book together and all this kind of stuff. I thought it was really, like, really fascinating to be able to talk a little bit about our process um, and, and also like, why we assembled the speakers that we did. It was a really, I think it was a really important point, and maybe this is something to say to students, about reflecting at the end of a process, uh, at the end of a project, on why you did what you did. You know, that it's really good to have, to not just ship it and say like, okay, I'm done, what's next? but to have someone maybe ask you some tough questions about why you did this this way. Um, and sometimes we get that from our users as well. Um, this year's span reader looked like this. It, you, it sort of reactivated the identity system in different ways. Um, we had uh, some die cuts of these primitive shapes that uh, kind of exposed the construction of the book, um, as well as stickers that you could use to customize, uh, customize the book and really make it your own. Uh, so we made a GIF to show you how to do it. Um, 
And um, you know, I think we'll, we'll, we try to share all the content in the span readers online as well. We have a post going up in the next couple of days on the 2016 reader. Um, the other thing uh, that we do that's a big part of what I do is the Google Design website, uh, which is a publishing effort. Uh, to share work across the company. Um, and you know, wh wh what that means is that we support launches like uh, the, the Google Identity. Uh, so when the Google Identity launched, there was, a, there was a post on the official Google blog. But then there was like a deeper kind of behind the scenes post on how we did it and how we collaborated across Google um, that kind of spoke a little bit more uh, about the design process. Um, and then you know, sometimes we have sort of smaller launches or social activations, like when we went to the Unicode Consortium and we proposed um, some new emojis for rep better representation of women in professional careers. Um, you know, we, we did these kind of fun little gifts and then also like, you know, activated, uh, activated that on Twitter and in other places. Um, and sometimes we just function as a guide. I mean, Google puts out a tremendous amount of information. And sometimes it's hard for designers to know what they should be paying attention to. So in a situation like IO, where there's hundreds of sessions going on, like what, a, what should a designer really focus on? So we made this kind of definitive guide uh, to IO. And we also do the same for SPAN. Um, and then I think one of the really exciting things that we do is we help uh, teams that are maybe pr working on Google projects that are a little bit further out start to begin to have a conversation with our audience about themes. So last summer, when we, we acquired the tool Pixate, um, we invited the CEO of Pixate and the, and the leader of Form and Matthias Duarte, our VP of design, to have a conversation about the state of design tools and to talk a little bit more and reflect a little bit more on you know, what excited them about that problem space, what was, what was motivating to them in terms of working in that problem space. Um, and then you know, a little over a year later, uh, we, we launched some of our own tools. And so like, this was a way to kind of set a conversation in motion that, that unfolded at SPAN and across the industry and, and was unfolding in various ways. And then you know, we got to kind of circle back to that conversation and have that conversation with our readers again. So this is a post called Design is Never Done, which announces, among other things, uh, material designs move to material.io, so sort of a, a site where it can be more broadly accessed by lots of different teams. Um, it, also, it also announced uh, three new tools for designers. Uh, gallery, which is a kind of um, a way of collaborating and ha in a secure environment for product teams. Stage, which is a way of creating motion uh, in a way that's closer to engineering and easier for designers who are not kind of motion designers by trade to do and to get prototypes up on their feet. And also Remixer, which is a way to kind of make uh, UI refinements in real time uh, across Android, web, and iOS. Um, so these tools, uh, some of them, uh, Remixer I know is available on GitHub, uh, and you know, some of the other tools you can sign up for betas, and we'll, we'll let you know when they're available. Um, we also try to kind of capture who's using material design in ways that are exciting to us and interesting to us, and try to celebrate those things. So um, we just did a feature on Robinhood, and you know, it's subtle, but you can also see that we've designed some ways of getting into the material design spec through, like maybe you, you love this design or you love the way that they're thinking about cards, and we were giving you access to that part of the material design spec in context. So that's sort of a great way to teach people about material design. Um, we also celebrate it more officially with the material design awards, um, and I brought a really short video for you about those. <laughs>
Um, every year we also make kind of a box that is a gift to some of our, our VIPs and people that we're really, we really want to keep, keep top of mind um, that kind of repackages some of the things that we've made throughout the year uh, and, and gives them in gift form. Um, if you want to stay tra keep track of what we're doing, this is the best way to do it, design.google.com slash newsletter. We kind of gather all that stuff up every quarter and try to send out a summary. Um, and you know, we also try to have a little fun. So when we hit a, a thousand followers on Twitter, we like burned some motion design hours and made, made some cool gifts. Um, we also try to be good citizens. So um, we sponsor a program called XXUX, uh, which is for um, women, in, women in design and, and UX professions. Um, and we sponsor a host of other organizations like uh, the Typographics Conference in New York when we launched Google Fonts, the London Design Museum, um, AGI, which is the International Conference of Designers, and AIGA uh, as well. In fact, we just launched a great design census, which you might have heard about, which is like kind of measuring the state of design. So um, look, f look for up design census if you get a chance, and there's some really great work there. Um, we make little documentaries about um, kind of how material design comes together. Uh, we make it more accessible to people. So at the Tokyo conference, we launched uh, a set of PDFs that translated material design into Japanese. Um, and finally, we produce videos that give some guidance around uh, how to use material design. So I will show that and then hand it over to Bethany. There are no wrong colors. What matters most is how you use them. But with such a broad spectrum to choose from, how do you know which colors will work for you? The Material Design Palette provides a simple, smart approach to building with color. Starting with the primary 500s, it scales from light to dark, offering a variety of carefully chosen values. These color ranges are then applied to different elements in the UI. The 500s are perfect for describing the dominant theme in your product and are great for toolbars. From there, Scale up to the 700s for status bars, or down to a 300 for secondary information. Accent colors are brighter and more saturated. They encourage user interaction, giving your UI a subtle but considered color pops. They are perfect for highlighting primary action buttons or fabs, standard buttons, switches, sliders, and more. The system for thinking about color is powerful, immersive, and completely adaptable to any application. Whether your brand is poppy and bright or serious and subdued, material design makes color work for you. Start building. Get to know the fundamentals of color on google.com slash design. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit more about the design system that was used to actually build a lot of the interfaces that you saw in the previous slides of the videos. And apologies, my voice is kind of going. I caught something on the airplane. So I will try and speak up as much as I can. Um, so the material design guidelines is what I personally work on on a daily basis as an interaction designer. Um, and I want to tell you about the history of it, as well as do a bit of a deep dive into the floating action button, the fab that Dave mentioned. So I don't know if you remember, but this is what <laughs> Gmail looked like in 2011. Um, my inbox looked like that, maybe yours did too. And um, about at that time, a group of designers underneath Nicholas Jitkoff came together and created a project called Kennedy to imagine what could Google look like on the web it was, if it was actually beautiful, like if there was white space and if we used color meaningfully and um, just to try and reimagine what this could be like. Um, and this was the result. Um, we were able to you know, kind of expand out the grid think more about the points of color. Um, you can't tell because of the, the blowout on the projector, but there is some usage of light gray and white to denote um, different states of things on screen. Um, and now the Google brand pops more. It's not surrounded by that like jail of you know, bars. Um, and this was really successful. The, um, the week that this was announced as a project was actually my first week at Google. And I remember the engineers giving it so much pushback, and I was surprised how angry they were. Um, but because um, this was so successful as a project, it actually bought the designers at Google a lot of credit um, and credibility um, that we were able to use moving forward in reimagining what Google's web and mobile properties could look, could look like. And that was kind of the beginning of material design. Um, so in around 2012, 2013, winter-ish, um, we locked a bunch of our visual and motion designers together in a room in New York. And we had them imagine 
what could Google look like, like as a brand, completely reimagined? What, what, what was their dream of Google and what could it be? Um, and I want to point out that that's really notable because not very many redesigns start with motion design at the center. Um, back then, just a few years ago, that was a very nascent job title within the UX community. Um, so I'm, I'm really proud that we gave such a big responsibility to motion designers there. Um, so some of the explorations that they started coming up with. Um, you can probably already see hints of material design in here, like the focus on um, typographic hierarchy, interesting use of illustration here, starting to get some blocks of color, um, even more blocks of color, some really gorgeous cues about where you should be looking on screen, what's important or not, what types of things are on screen. Um, and we engaged in some design fiction ourselves of imagining like, what is actually inside this device? Like, you're holding it, and there's a little bit of space um, between the screen and the back of your hand. What's actually in there? Can we actually design in both the X, well, in the X and the Y axis, but also in the Z axis, too? What could we capitalize that or use that for? Um, so we started doing more crazy layering explorations. Um, I don't think we ever got this sort of volumetric um, language back into material design. Um, but at this time, we started calling the material that we were working with quantum paper, this like magical substance with um, interesting universal properties and that created all the interface elements using quantum paper. Um, and then we took that a step further. We actually cut the icons out of paper as we we're designing it. Um, our lead visual designer set up this crazy rig in his garage with lighting and so that he could get the shadows exactly right, imagining what the in-device um, lighting rig could look like. And we looked at what icons um, made out of paper would behave like. Um, we also knew that because we wanted to bring this to Android and make it a universal design language, this was going to have to work for third parties. Um, so we did explorations on branding. Um, would brands be recognizable even with our new language? Um, and so I'm just going to show you a few explorations here. Netflix, um, Hulu. The app bar is in a weird place there, but it's part of the fun. Uh, Yelp, Spotify. Um, so as we we're building this out, we, we decided that our goal was going to be a bold, beautiful, and consistent user interface across all platforms and across all devices. And that meant building out design patterns that worked across different form factors. Um, so. Um, in the end, we decided to kind of showcase the flexibility of the system using product families in these vignettes. Um, and this is an example email app um, where you can see that these are all related with the sort of color and structure that underlies the app, um, but there's diversity in the presentation. Um, this is a fake file browser um, where, again, the overall structure is consistent, but then Use of drawers and panels is very tailored to each device and the form factor that you have there. Um, we wanted to look at um, how you can bring immersive imagery back out of the mobile uh, interface where we saw a lot of really interesting usage of photography and illustration on mobile apps, but it wasn't really translating back into desktop. So we looked, or looked at this and thought, well, you know, maybe we can figure out places to uh, bring it back in a very bold manner. Um, and lastly, in this calendar example, um, we try to use you know, shape and color to really um, help with the family feel across all of these form factors. Um, and I really like this video. This, this shows just what material design got, gave us. Um, you know, the avatars went to circles, refined our typography, really evened out our grid. Um, we've got the color accent, and then the fab shows up in the corner. Um, so it's really night and day, the difference. Um, so we developed three core design principles that we try and use to continue to build out the design language as well as um, use as guidance for third parties who want to use material design. Um, and they are that material is the metaphor. Um, material is this, the substance. We, we went from quantum paper to material. Um, that gives the user a sense that they're actually working with real things in the interface. It's, it's not this you know, fake pixel digital thing that's just swirling around under your, underneath your finger, but we want to give your brain something to hold on to as a cue. Uh, 
the, the middle one is meant to represent that it, uh, material is bold, graphic, and intentional. Um, we really emphasize hierarchy, both because it's very beautiful visually, but also because it gives us usability benefits. Um, and lastly, we, I mean, as you saw from the inception of the project, motion provides meaning. Motion is super important within material design to guide the user's eyes through transitions and let them know like, what they should be looking at. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the FAB. Um, it's, so FAB stands for Floating Action Button. Um, you may be familiar with it. It's, I think, one of the visual hallmarks of material design. It's kind of turned into that. Um, it's usually a round button with an icon on it, usually anchored somewhere in the corner of a screen and um, a bright color. Um, so back when the visual designers were imagining what material design could look like and what our layouts and structures would be, uh, they decided to put together these things called white frames just to kind of explore the power of our grid and how it would actually work out. And um, as we started doing design reviews all together, we realized that these <coughs> looked really flat. Like, it's very conventional. There's, there's nothing really special about these. Um, and so the visual designers were kind of realized that the layouts needed a focal point. Um, and this was just kind of their gut sense as graphic designers, right? Like, um, the eye needs something to be drawn to within this composition. Um, and sort of coincidentally, at the same time as we're all having these conversations together with weekly design reviews and spending hours in conversation with each other, um, myself and the other interaction designers were kind of discussing how we might use this new idea of layering and hierarchy to improve the usability of screens. Um, so if something like a button was on the top of everything on screen and closer to the user, what might it signal? And can we capitalize on this circle that's, that's now becoming an interesting part of the interface? Um, and a reminder, this was Android at the time. Um, so this is what we were working with. And um, you'll notice at the top, is the gray bar, and we call that the Android app bar. Or I think it used to be the Android action bar. And um, you can see that there's just a row of icons in there. Um, they're all the same you know, height and width and color, which is good for consistency, but you can't actually determine which is the most important out of all of those icons. Um, but each of those icons actually does very vastly different things. And um, between apps, these icons do very vastly different things. Um, so how do you help users discover which might be the most important one to fulfill core tasks? Um, so I, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Eventually the fab um, kind of highlights one of those actions and pulls it into a corner of the screen. And I want to use that as a compare and contrast with something else that you're probably very familiar with as an interaction designer or as a designer here, which is the hamburger menu, the very reviled hamburger menu. Um, you can see kind of a, a mini version of it on the screen on the right-hand side. And um, it's actually doing kind of a similar function as what the fab does, which is that it collects similar things, puts them in a corner, and it's um, kind of the shortcut for the user. Uh, but in the hamburger menu's case, it's navigational. And it's also hiding a lot of stuff underneath there, uh, which is why it's controversial. But if you think about it just kind of at a pure visual sense, it's just icons on a piece of material. Um, so interesting to like compare how different parts of a design language kind of complement each other, but also um, this, it just has to fit together as a system. OK, so back to fabs. Um, we started doing almost a pattern analysis of how often certain types of actions as represented by buttons would appear on screen. And, um, we realized that we could also be bold here, too, using that uh, principle of material design of boldness. Um, by making fabs really rare to highlight how important they are, we didn't want a, like five circles on every screen. Um, and we still actually do a lot of analysis right now uh, because we see so many UIs float by our faces every day. And so we've, we've become very good at recognizing patterns of like just what's emergent in the um, HCI world. Um, and this is an illustration from our spec, um, just the, the side view of this um, kind of map of the Z space that we've created. Uh, we've created a new metric called the vertical dip. You might be familiar with, you know, 
dips in the horizontal um, space, but we also have created uh, vertical dips. And um, here too, the fab elevation story is really pushing that idea that this action is very important to the core task because it actually is floating above all other elements on screen. And when the user interacts with the fab, um, it's probably hard to see in some of the previous uh, animations that Rob showed, but um, it actually raises another six dips um, to really highlight the fact that the user is powerful and making something happen within this interface. So that's how we got the fab. Um, these are some illustrations from spec. Now we um, ask you to highlight it with an accent color. We have a component in code for it for many of our platforms, so it's very easy to drop into an interface. Um, and we think it's an important part of the interface. So as we build out the componentry with code and we think about how this is gonna be used widely, you know, this fab is a very new idea. And as people adopt it, adapt it around the world, what are they gonna do with it? Will they use it well? Um, we have to consider all of our users, too, and what all of their contexts are. Um, and this is where accessibility comes in. So how is someone with disabilities gonna, is, how will someone with disabilities interact with this interface? Um, I came up with three kind of very basic accessibility principles in order to guide material design, which is that it needs to be clear. The fab's supposed to be showing like the focal point. Um, so that the user always knows what the task at hand is. Um, an interface needs to be robust so that a user of any ability can complete the task with room for error. Um, and lastly, it needs to be very specific. So um, many platforms have specific solutions to support people with disabilities, like supporting large text or supporting magnification or screen reader software. Um, and so we want people to be very specific and know like what sort of um, software they need to support. Um, and I do want to point out that this is not just for a small group of people. Um, the World Health Organization estimated that one in seven people experience disability globally, which is over a billion people. Um, so you start to think about like that scale and also the scale of who Google reaches. There's going to be a lot of overlap there. Um, I want to, you know, posit the idea. It's actually larger than that. It's 100% of people. Um, there's this new philosophy, new-ish, called universal design um, that's starting to get more traction in the UI world. And um, it's a way of thinking about how everyone experiences various forms of disability throughout their day, um, and that designing for disabilities can benefit everybody. Um, so in this graphic, um, we can see that maybe somebody without sight, if it's permanent, they would be blind, but that could also be a temporary condition, and sometimes it's just situational. Um, you're looking at your phone in the map, there could be glare in your eyes, um, and thinking about designing for the, um, the long tail of the user will help everybody along the spectrum here. I also want to point out that um, accessibility and universal design is something that architects have considered for decades now at this point. And I think that as interface architects and designers, I think we have the same sort of responsibility towards accessibility, just as if we were doing a physical construction. Um, and this is what I try to remind myself of as I work. Um, so this is what it looks like to create on-screen ramps, as it were. Um, I was sketching out how we might treat and code the fab, because I did the interaction design for the fab. And I also wanted to make sure the accessibility of it was robust, too. Um, so I was considering how a blind user might navigate around the screen to locate the fab using screen reader software. Um, and there's some interesting things that emerged uh, with the fab and accessibility around um, like the placement. Being close to the edge was actually really helpful because users who are blind um, are able to navigate their cursor to the edges of the screen very easily. And so that was just kind of a natural shortcut for them. They could just flick it to where the fab was. Um, and there's other qualities of material design that actually support universal design characteristics too. Um, so things like the bold color lends itself well to good color contrast for people who have low vision. Um, our 
very nice grid and our layout patterns um, is really helpful for people to be able to visually navigate through, these, through the screen. Um, we have generous touch target sizing. So if you've got a little bit of tremor or um, if you can't see the screen, it really helps so that you can actually uh, touch the thing that you intend to. Um, and our focus on hierarchy and really making the designer choose what is important on screen, we think helps lower the cognitive load of the user. We still have some challenges around pure universal design, which is internationalization, and um, people who don't have as much exposure to um, internet aesthetics, they don't actually recognize that that's a button. Um, so we still have to figure out what to do there. Um, so lastly, people actually use the fab. So these are three third-party apps, Trello, The Hunt, and B&H Photo. Um, and I think they're using it really well. I, we probably gave them awards at some point. Um, for these two in particular, um, they're using the fab as a creation tool. Um, and it works really nicely on top of these um, kind of fields of cards because when they create a thing, it creates a new sheet of material, which is card-like. So you can tell that there's a relationship between the creation and um, the grid that it's on. And then for B&H Photo, um, the fab is actually on a seam of material, as we call it. And um, it's a really nice transition between the like, top level category description and the categories below it because it's a search. Um, so I think it's designed very well and placed well. Um, and um, it's actually been good for their business, too. So um, some statistics. B&H Photo got a 700% increase in sales after they redesigned material, um, which shows you the impact of design. Um, Trello got 42% more boards created per session, uh, user session. And The Hunt um, got a 30% increase in users starting new hunts relative to their non-material platforms. Um, so it's been really interesting and rewarding to see such a wide variety of products starting to use material. Um, I think by now there's probably around a million apps on the Google Play Store who are using material as their core design language. Um, and I'm, I'm very grateful to see that happen. And it's very motivating for me to think about how our guidelines and tools are being used um, and how it's being communicated out um, so that we can really improve design around the world. So thank you. So the first question that we had was actually for Rob on um, just kind of given your involvement with SPAN and pushing Google design forward, um, where do you see like, I guess, future state um, kind of, were there, I guess, any interesting topics or discussion that made you think about like the future state of SPAN, Google design, and like just design in general going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think a couple things emerged this year from Span that were really helpful. Um, you know, last year we had uh, conferences in New York and London, and you know, just for, just because of logistics and trying to keep uh, keep them efficient, uh, we we tried to source speakers that were local to each of those locations. Um, and in doing that, I actually think we really activated communities of designers and technologists outside of Silicon Valley, um, away from Google's headquarters and sort of learn from those communities in a, really, in, a, in a ways that were more specific to those communities and to the needs that they had. Uh, and so we continued that trend this year with, with Tokyo and LA. Um, and I think that kind of hyper-local focus is really exciting. Um, it lets us engage designers in a much more personal way, which is really the point of having a conference where everybody's in the same room. Um, I think at the same time, you know, it, all, it creates a diversity of thought because um, you, know, you have people with different practices that we can then record and broadcast to designers in Mountain View or wherever they might be. Um, and we can bring those, those ideas to a broader community because, because we're Google and we could do that. Um, and so I feel like that, that feels like a good citizenship kind of balance to me. Um, it's also really inspiring for a lot of people at Google because it's, it's a chance to ask you know, anyone from Facebook to an independent designer with two people working in their studio what, how they solve problems. Um, and it's a, it's a place where, that, where we can be really open about that and, and sort of test um, or even mine um, design practices that are very different from, as, as with the case of a stone carver, very different from our own. So, um, you know, I think the thing that I'm very proud of uh, in the first uh, design, in this first span set of conferences was that I think a critique 
that can often be levy levied at the tech industry is that it's ignorant of history and particularly design history that in pursuing new experiences and launching new products, we're very focused on the future and not so much on the past. And I think design actually has um, a different setting that's really important to acknowledge. So, you know, design is connected to a tradition. You know, we, we know about grids because there's been generations of designers that have been exploring the grid. Um, and so to sort of say that this is a completely new thing somehow feels false and also makes designers feel less connected to the past that they sort of stand on the shoulders of. So, I'm really proud that we were able to bring certain aspects of tech design history to SPAN, and I feel like really excited about continuing to do that alongside pursuing and asking questions about themes that Google has in the year, Th themes like VR or the Assistant or things like that. Very cool. Um, I, I'm really interested in, uh, it's really cool that you guys like had SPAN like, in two different locations, one local, one global. Um, did you do any like comparison as to um, what the design conversation was in Tokyo versus here. Is there like any uh, difference? I, I asked because uh, this summer I, sp I spent the summer at Uber and uh, we were talking about like designing for the Asian uh, uh, audience and it turns out that there's like significant differences in like the, the principles that you should follow there versus here. Yeah, so I mean, I think you can do, you can obviously as a design team do a certain amount of R&D kind of behind a curtain, and, and certainly we do that. Uh, but I think Span is actually, because it has to ship, <laughs> um, we actually, it actually lets us do a little bit of R&D in public. So the case, in the case of localizing a conference, that's actually a more defined problem space than localizing an entire design language. But it lets us sort of try to do some of the things around localization that we knew we needed to do in order to reach that group of users. Um, I think in terms of specifics of like the design community there, one of the things that I thought was really inspiring, uh, we had a d we ha you know we always try to engage the venture capital um, scene and the startup scene in, 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 in these different communities. Um, and we had one speaker who sort of talked a lot about how searches of starting your own business in Japan were on the rise, and a lot of that had to do with access to new design tools. Um, and so that was really exciting for me to see, that kind of engagement. Um, you know, instead of working maybe your whole life in a particular company, that you could kind of go off and start your own company and feel more motivated to, to do that. Cool. Um, so the next question's for Rob. And, um, I think some people think of material design as like uh, a visual design language, and but then like as we saw, it's more than just like visual design. There's you know motion, there's interaction, and um, in our class and amongst like the students uh, today, like we're also starting to like think about voice interface and gestural and VR. Do you see material design? Can you see it being applied to like other platforms, other interfaces? Yeah, and you know, I think I think the idea of creating um, a kind of a set of specifications is 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 a is a language that's common to designers and engineers. And so within Google, we have specifications for things like brand voice or user interface language um, or even sound. Um, and so I think you know whether you know I think those things will will certainly be thought about more and more in material design as material design gets used for more and more scenarios like chatbots or um, voice activated things or you know those th I don't think we draw a line and say those aren't designed experiences just because they're not UI. Um, so I think you know I, I think like anything we would want to be doing our homework on that and make sure that the things that we're doing at Google are really what we would recommend everyone use. But at the same time. Um, absolutely, I think those are exciting frontiers to, to engage with. And I don't know if Bethany has anything to say about that too. But um, I just just one small thing about how material design could translate to VR, um, because we tried to use these very physics-based principles in creating our material design language, um, with you know the light and the shadow and this piece of paper that would you know shape shift in order to accommodate the content. Um, early studies of Google designers working in VR found that material design actually translated really well to that environment, which is really heartening for us to tell us that we were going in the right direction with material design, um, that there's something about its you know, physics-basedness that made it a little bit more universal to any sort of visual interface. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah so um, maybe you could speak to this, Bethany, but i um, interested in your thoughts on or I guess challenges maybe on how to get other product teams within Google to always comply to the material design guidelines, um, what that process is like. And I know you do a lot of um, design reviews with product teams to kind of go over, kind of match guideline spec stuff to their actual work. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think we calculated that 
Uh, in the last three years, we've probably done around a thousand design reviews for different apps, both inside and outside of Google, which is a lot of meetings to be in, um, and a lot of random conversations at, I, at IO as well. Um, but I think for us, what we've started to realize is it's always about the user. We always try and pull the product team back to the user and think about like, what is their expectation? What will they expect from Google as a brand? And I think material is really important there. What will they expect from either Android or iOS or the web as a platform? So like what sort of you know, patterns and characteristics do we need to push them towards if they're trying to really veer way off of established patterns? Um, and then of course, like what is their product actually gonna do for the user? And we try and piece together the right solution using material design components in order to solve those problems. Um, we, we do have a phrase, uh, it's called deviate with purpose. And we like it when people play around with material design and when they go a little bit off spec or a lot off spec, as long as they know what they're doing and they understand the effect that it's gonna have on the user. Um, so we're happy to see people play with it, but I don't know, we, we wanna protect the user experience at the core. Uh, and then just a quick follow up on yeah. that, like what about um, engineering teams and kind of compliance with guidelines? Yeah, well I think that's where componentry comes in. So the idea that um, you can have a library of code that already has a fab built in it, or uh, we have a component called the snack bar um, that nobody knows what it is, but I enjoy the name. <laughs> um, and because those uh, pieces of code are just right there and ready to drop into the interface, uh, we found that most engineers that we worked with are really happy to work with those things. Um, there's a lot of pushback when we say we want you to do this design, but there's no existing code for it. And that's when they're like, no, 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 we're, we're gonna use something else. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Can I have the next one too? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so kind of moving into accessibility, you spoke a bit about that. Um, can you talk a little bit more about like universal accessibility or design versus kind of like condition specific things? Because I know there's, I mean, there are certain things that are uh, you need to follow when designing for vision impaired or, you know, so how does universal design and accessibility compare to like some of the specific needs for certain users? Yeah, um, when I think I showed on the diagram, I think it's definitely a spectrum um, of permanent, um, temporary and situational. And I think it's actually important for all designers to be aware of what the spectrum spans, even if they're not gonna, going to develop a product for the most tail end of that user spectrum. Um, I think there's, it's just one of those things that we have to be aware of as designers of knowing what is the full range of users who are gonna use our products. Um, at the same time, like I'm very aware that there is just a need sometimes to design things for these user groups. And I really love it when I see organizations put the time, money, and energy into actually hiring people and supporting them in building out those things and, and letting them specialize in those products. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it's that one person has to do it all. I think there's a lot of room for multiple people to be playing and conversing in that space. Mm. One of the insights I had from working with you and the accessibility people this summer was that in certain cases, people don't want to feel like they're getting a separate experience oh, um, yeah. as an accessibility. Like mm -hmm. I noticed that even in some of the testing I did of uh, people feeling like they were getting a separate thing um, was not, was a negative. Have you run into that in your work? Oh yeah, I totally agree with that. I think that's almost like a justice design principle where we don't want to serve different people completely different experiences. I mean, if somebody can't see your interface, like they can't see your interface, but we would never give them a completely different feature set um, because we'd like to think that, you know, the core user tasks of our products, like those are universal. Everybody wants to communicate. Everybody wants to order food. Everybody wants to make a call. Um, but the ways that they go about that might be different, but we want to just support that core thing for everyone. I don't know. If do you have anything you want to add? I think just, I think as you're speaking, it occurs to me like two things. I mean, number one, to tie it back to the Google mission, I mean, I think we call it accessibility and Google's mission is to make the world's information more universally accessible and useful. And so, you know, accessibility really is part of who Google is. Um, and so that's, uh, that's also something that's really good to remind everyone of when we are talking with them. 
Um, and also the layeredness of all these components, you know, that there's so many decisions and considerations being made in all these components that it's product teams aren't to be faulted for prioritizing a new feature over implementing a baseline grid or a color that's differentiated so, you know, enough for people with, with vision issues. I think there's like a sense in which we can do a lot of that initial work for them and the component tree can then give them all of those things for free that are far down their feature list, but nevertheless they want to serve their users really well. So I think, I mean, the most fascinating thing to me has been um, in, in moving from a client and a service driven uh, design profession to like Google, um, where we have like these teams are really our partners. And, you know, in any sort of relationship, there's a lot of give and take. You know, they share designs with us that we review and give feedback on, but then we also share components and things back to them that we want them to implement. And the more that we can help each other, the more that that becomes a virtuous cycle. And, and you build a relationship that, just like a product, isn't something that you just ship and, and leave behind, but it's something that you continue to cultivate and maintain. So I think, I think that's actually the lesson of how we've been successful um, in rolling this out, is really through, through relationships between designers and engineers across the company. And you're starting to answer the next question that, that <laughs> uh, I had, but uh, that's a great segue. So I, I guess like for people who are interested in uh, designing for accessibility or like designers who are aware of accessibility, oftentimes they have to grapple with, um, should they focus on accessible features right now versus, um, versus like business needs and like pushing the, the next feature? Uh, so like how, how does Google manage that balance? And how do you guys, do you guys often have to have those conversations with, with the product teams? I think that, you know, certainly products are their own world in some ways. And so I think what we try to do is, is take those concerns and that balancing off the table by taking care of it for them and servicing them better and better with the things that we make. Um, because I think we feel like those things aren't in conflict, actually. You know, making an excellent product is not it opposed to making a profitable or successful product. Do you know what I mean? And I, and I think the more that you can keep the opposition from those uh, more of an integration, the better that, and remind people of that and be a really, really good communicator about why the, those things are not in conflict. I think that's, that, to me, that's the thing that has been successful um, in terms of communicating that on my, on my own, in my own case. But you've done a lot more reviews than me, so maybe you have another strategy. <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> I mean, I think accessibility needs are business needs and vice versa. To me, they just flow into one another. Like, if you want the widest possible user base, um, if you consider like people who are elderly to be part of your target user base, um, which I think they um, don't, they're not often thought about as a demographic. Like, um, it's just good business to make things that work for all people, um, and people forget that. So we try to remind them. Uh, I guess last question before we open up is what's next for material design? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to do SPAN 2017. Okay. Uh, no, I mean, I think, um, I think a big thing that's on my mind, you know, is, is thinking about how we continue to bring more and more of the great design culture uh, within Google out and share that with everyone. So um, I think, you know, material design is, a, is, a, is the name of a team and it's a group of people, but it's also really a culture that we're trying to build. Uh, both a culture within the company and also a culture, you know, contribute to design culture more generally. And so um, I'm curious about what happens to material design when it simply becomes design, like when it simply becomes a scale, when it's, you know, after a million, after you have a billion apps in the Play Store or a billion apps using this, this design framework, is it, is it something that should have a ring around it anymore, or is it more just sort of an ethos of how you work in as a temporary or contemporary product team? Um, I think that's really, really interesting. You know, we, comparing it again to architecture, you know, we saw at mid-century a glacial change in, you know, or not a glacial, but a sort of, a sort of huge change in how people thought about building a home. You know, and, so, and there are enough homes to be built that you could change the entire landscape of, of how you think about living um, and space. And I think that that's sort of, we live in our phones. I mean, that's a lot, in a lot of ways, we we spend a lot of time with them. And so we can really affect people's consciousness in an aggregate way very profoundly through the work that we do. And I think scaling that effort, that's what draws all of us to Google is like the scale, the kind of amazing scale that you can have and the way that you can have really smart, motivated colleagues who challenge you and, and push you to do great things. So. Thank you, Bethany. Thank you, Rob, again. Um, can we all give a <laughs>